tightening global liquidity and when global liquidity tightens it's obviously not good for economic growth and it's not good for asset markets and so this is very important to in the analysis of future trends as, so, as soon as the dollar is weak it means money is flowing into the world there's excess liquidity again and then asset markets go up including of course equities and also gold and silver and other commodities now what happened in 2008 is unusual in, in a historical sense because a equities totally collapsed they lost from peak to trough 32 trillion dollars now recently they've rebounded somewhat but we're still much below the peak here and also what is different from a historical point of view is the following we had very serious recessions in 73 74 in my opinion more serious than what we have had so far this time around we had a very serious recession in 81 82 and also a minor recession in 1991 but in these past recessions you can see that home prices in the US here is 73 74 here is 82 90 they never went down in 1990 they briefly went down because of one state California but basically we never had house price declines and therefore people in America said home prices will never go down but this time around you can see that home prices really collapsed this is unusual and it destroyed a lot of wells but the Federal Reserve again will tell you well the problem is that home prices went down but that is not the problem I want to explain to you what the problem was here you have at the bottom of this figure homeowners equity homeowners equity means how much money people have in the house say if you buy a house for a hundred thousand and you pay eighty thousand then you have eighty percent homeowners equity you only borrow twenty thousand and that was the pattern in the 1950s and even here in 1973 74 and 82 we had a home owners equity of 70 percent but encouraged by the Federal Reserve and by the way also by institutions that are government sponsored like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac people borrowed more and more against their homes and so home owners equity here declined very strongly and is now at the present time just 43 percent in other words of all the homes in the United States 43 percent is own capital and 53 percent is borrowings now 33 percent of homes in the United States are owned without any mortgages they are they may have been bought 50 years ago and so they have no mortgages they're fully paid it means that 67 percent of homes they have now 15 percent or less equity that is the problem if you own your home and you have no mortgage and no debt it doesn't matter the house goes up 20 percent or down 20 percent or 30 percent it's still the same house the problem is the leverage that is the problem in Hong Kong after 1997 home prices declined by 70 percent none of the major developers or construction companies went bankrupt and very few homeowners went bankrupt why because they had low borrowings against their homes and the property developers in Hong Kong their capital structure is usually about 80 percent own capital and only 20 percent are borrowings and so that is the big difference between other countries and the US in the US we have simply too much debt debt to GDP is too high that is the problem now I mentioned that the Federal Reserve in the period 2001 to 2007 never pursued tight monetary policies and let me explain what I mean by that if you're a central bank and you want to tighten monetary conditions you can increase interest rates but you have to increase them up to a point where credit growth slows down 
And at that time when credit growth slows down, you have tight monetary policies. Now in the case of the US, you can see that after I showed you 2004, they started to increase the interest rates in baby steps from 1% to 5 one quarter percent. But what happened is here, credit growth in 2004 was 7% annual rate. And then it accelerated to a peak of 18% annual rate of credit growth in the United States at the end of 2006. And that is most unusual. I mean, that the Federal Reserve could sit there and sleep over this and not realize that this was not going to be sustainable in the long run, to have credit growth running at 18% per annum, and also to see that credit was growing at five times the rate of GDP growth. Between 2000 and 2007, total credit increased by $21.3 trillion, but the economy only expanded by $4.2 trillion. So in other words, Credit was growing at a much faster rate than economic growth, but the Federal Reserve didn't see that. And then when the crisis began to unfold and the Federal Reserve initially thought that the subprime lending crisis was an isolated event, but eventually they noticed that the whole United States was subprime. And so credit growth began to slow down here in 2007 at the beginning, but when they cut the interest rates, it expanded once again. In other words, as I said before, the Federal Reserve has destabilized the economy more than would have take, been the case if the Federal Reserve had done nothing. And then when the crisis really spread in 2008, credit growth collapsed. Now, if you have an economy that is dependent on continuously increasing the amount of debt to create economic growth, then obviously once you have this credit slowdown, you have a major problem. Now the Federal Reserve knows about this and therefore what they've done is basically you have here the private credit is contracting. In other words, people, normal people, they're acting rationally. They see a problem so they start to save and spend less and pay back debts. But here comes the government and the government increases its balance sheet through large fiscal deficits. This year, the total credit of the government in the US, in other words, the total debt, government debt, will increase by more than $2 trillion. And the Federal Reserve is expanding its balance sheet. In other words, they're printing money. They're buying tre treasury bonds and agency securities and expanding its balance sheet. So you have two opposing forces. And the private credit sector is withdrawing money from the system and saving. The government is throwing money at the system. And that then creates huge volatilities in asset markets. Because at times the private sector is overwhelming the government sector. And so it's negative for asset markets like in 2008. And then it comes the government prints money like crazy. And that's why you have this huge increase in commodity prices and in stock markets after essentially the beginning of this year. First, the commodity markets bottomed out, and then the dollar peaked out February 28, 2009, started to go down. March 6, the S&P was at 666, it starts to go up. And as you know, we went now to close to 1100. So this policy, of the government to print money and create huge fiscal deficits, that is creating additional economic and financial volatility. But I want to explain another point. The government in the US is adding, say, at the present time, $2 trillion to its government debt. And so the government debt is expanding very rapidly as a percent of the economy. And it will reach, in my opinion, in about four years' time, 100% of the economy, 100% of GDP. The problem will be one day when the Federal Reserve should increase interest rates because there could be some inflationary pressures in the future. And so when the Federal Reserve should increase interest rates, they'll be very reluctant to do so because at that point, if they increase interest rates,